Hello, welcome back. You're watching The Great British Breakfast with Kirsty and Simon. Now, in two months' time, Glasgow will host COP26, an international summit addressing climate change. As the conference approaches, different sectors and academic fields have started pitching suggestions of how best to address environmental changes. A new report from the Adam Smith Institute and the British Conservation Alliance argues that nuclear energy, carbon tax and clean free markets will be essential in tackling these issues. OK, well, let's get more on this. Connor Tomlinson is policy director at the British Conservation Alliance, who co-authored the report. Connor, we are, we're just trying to uh, get him at the moment. Are you there, Connor? Uh... He will be. Yeah, we've got him, Connor. Good morning. Ah, there you are. Excellent. Sorry about Wonderful. that. Wonderful. <laughs> Good right. morning. Thanks for joining us. So, Connor, just tell us how exactly can free markets help solve the climate crisis? Well, there's, there's a, there's a uh, phenomenon we've seen at the moment. There's two certainties in climate policy from the last couple of years. And that's number one, that most nations around the world, particularly the Paris Accord nations, have been dead set on making these 2050 targets of net neutrality for emissions. Now, the feasibility of getting there by 2050 is negotiable, especially when mired in government bureaucracy. But the second tenet, as we've seen when Rishi Sunak was interviewed by Andrew Neil um, on Your Great Network, that the government is set on achieving this through central planned economics and big spending. And what that means is if any of the schemes go wrong, the taxpayer is always going to be on the hook, not just for the new taxes, but also for the extreme costs that a lot of businesses are going to factor into their prices. Uh, things like the nappy tax and that are going to really bog down lowest income families particularly. So the market approach instead takes the costs, the risks and rewards away from the government, which means away from the taxpayer pocket, puts it purely on the private sector. And that means the private sector can take all the gambles with innovation, be rewarded with the profit incentives, but we still benefit from the clean air and the clean water and things are much more affordable in the long term. Mm. The British Conserv Conservation Alliance, your group, who mm. are you? Because I, I, you're a relative new, new group and who finances you? What's, what's, what's this all about? Well, so we are the largest campus-based uh, market environmentalist at work, uh, network in the country. We've got a uh, large presence at quite a few UK universities, and we're pretty much volunteer-led entirely. I mean, I've actually never taken payment for any of the work that I've done since I helped set it up with uh, uh, a few of my friends. And we uh, try and push market environmentalist ideas into the uh, general policy sphere, given that currently the environmental debate has been monopolised, as people have seen, with all of the Extinction Rebellion dancing around and doing really useful things uptown for the last couple of weeks. It's been dominated by big government spending and socialist ideas. So we've tried to push back against that just through um, policy papers, um, speaking uh, our speakers network for university campus events, um, just to combat both the heavily uh, socialist campus culture and the dialogue that's ongoing and has permeated even a uh, halls of government. So, I, I, so you're, you're anti the sort of left-leaning, left uh, green-led groups, uh, and we, we can all think of a few of them. But, but I'm still interested because you've got a very impressive website, there's clearly money being spent on this, but, but who's financing this? Uh, we've got, generally speaking, a few donors that are sort of correlative with uh, with our mission statement. I think in terms of the exact uh, who's who's who, you'd have to talk to my funding director for that. But um, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to ask for that. But I mean, we're, we're not a sort of dark money type. So, <laughs> but I mean, but your message seems to be look, that there are there are solutions out there, and mm. and and, and the, the free market basically can sort this all out. Yes, essentially, that's what the paper uses. We use three case studies. We look at uh, nuclear energy, um, mm. uh, how to alter the current plans for a carbon tax, because presently it's going to try. It's trying to replace the fuel duty, um, because obviously that's going to decline over time as we wean ourselves off fossil fuels. The problem is that's going to hit low-income families hardest. I've also done an accompanying article a couple of months ago about the electric car ban and how that's going to be pretty terrible at the rate that they're going. So try making that revenue neutral by cutting income Sorry, tax. The electric that car ban. What's that? Uh, not electric car ban, sorry, this early in the morning. Uh, the petrol car ban, so that they're right. trying to enforce okay. the electric cars coming in. There we go. <laughs> See, you got me up too early. Um, and the <laughs> third one would be uh, clean free trade agreements. So we're entering, I know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Liz Trust has been doing a lot of work on that. One of the main problems with that is, though, it's got investor state 
uh, disclosure agreement clauses. And that means that we're on the hook for when we want to try and disconnect from fossil fuels. We've got to buy them from certain member countries. And so we're going to be subject to lawsuits like Canada have been and, and when Biden cancelled the Keystone XL pipeline again, that they're going to be. Uh, and also joining things like ACTS, so the agreement on climate change. Um, something like that can make us as a nation a, a very strong voice in negotiating these global trade agreements, which will be crucial for, for international trade in the future. I, I mean, I don't want to come over as an old grump, um, and because obviously you, you, you're young, you're young people uh, with, with a fresh approach to all this, and, and you're pushing the, the nuclear industry side of this. They're not financing you in any way, are they? No, more than not, as, not as far as I know. <laughs> okay, uh, and, and and how many how many members are, are there? Because you're, you're, you, I think you describe yourself as sort of a, a millennial group. Yes, yeah, we're, we're sort of millennial Gen Z. We've, we've got, uh, we've got some thirty-year-olds on the staff that I, I make fun of for being ancient, even though I'm definitely feeling it after lockdown. I can tell you, um, we've got, a, I think there's seven or eight of us in our board of directors. If I've forgotten anyone, I'll be, I'll be lambasted. And we've got a university. We've got members of about seventy British universities at this point. So we've expanded pretty quickly, um, and it's pretty lovely to have everyone on staff on. To be honest, because over lockdown, of course the student experience was completely crippled um, and we were all sat indoors doing our work and we all became quite a close-knit group so uh, uh, I'm sure I'm the least least favorable member on staff if you ask around but uh, I've got high opinions of them all so I suspect we'll be talking again um, particularly with the project COP26 Co so thank you very much for your time this morning good to see you and I'm sorry to get you up so early thanks very much <laughs> that's all right <laughs> thank you <laughs>